said, how cool is it that you can eat your research? So at that moment, I decided that I wanted to do marine science for the rest of my life. So once I graduated from high school, um, I was looking for a place that I could do this. I knew I had some family connections, life experiences, and familiarity with Charleston area, Charleston, South Carolina. So at that time, I enrolled in the marine biology program at the College of Charleston. I dual majored in marine biology and biology. I managed to leverage some, ho some housing for my family in a tiny home just blocks away from the beach. And this image here shows you the boardwalk uh, of my beach on Sullivan's Island. I spent a lot of time there going to the beach, exploring, enjoying all of the, the beauty of the, um, the Southeast. I became fully immersed in my studies and loved every minute of it. it also, I also made a lifestyle of it at the time. Um, when I was in college and afterwards, I would work for a kayak company and I would le lead uh, eco tours through the salt marsh. Um, I also started a marine ecology day camp for youth, uh, which I ran for a couple of summers. I just love being in the mud, studying hermit crabs, doing everything I could to get my feet wet, my feet muddy, and just my body in the ocean. After about six years in South Carolina, I felt like it was re I was ready to move on to something new and different, and I had aspirations to go to graduate school. I knew I needed to broaden my horizons and get some more experience. So I applied for a job as a marine fisheries observer based out of New Bedford, Mass. So New Bedford, Massachusetts, if you guys have not been there, is steeped in maritime history. This is the foundation, the epicenter of the whaling industry, and the culture still fir holds firm in that area. When I arrived, I did not know what I was getting into. This was super different experiment experience for me. And after three weeks of training and hearing all the horror stories of working on fishing boats and sailing the high seas, I have to admit that I was a little scared. I was also fascinated with what we were learning and nervous about what I would experience. My first trip out on Cape Cod Bay, I was hooked. I loved every moment of it. I worked primarily ground fish trawls, which are kind of shown here, and also did some scallopers and a couple tuna trips way off of George's Bank. The experience was a life-changing one for me. I was always interested in marine biology, but this really gave me a new perspective. I learned about the commercial, commercial fishing as an industry, the culture and the history. I learned about the mistrust that fishermen have in science and misunderstanding of how management practices are developed. I gained a ton of respect for the fishermen who I still to this day believe are the hardest working people on the planet. I also learned firsthand the terrible state of the ocean and its fisheries. I was on a trip where we trawled a net for seven hours on the ocean floor and caught nothing. I knew something was wrong. I decided that I want to move towards a career in applied fishery science. And I really felt that I had something to contribute to the field. So this is the story of how I started down my path. And everyone in this room has a similar story to tell, an experience that they can point to that led them to this minute, being here at HMSC right now, listening to me speak right now. This is something that we all share. Given that the focus of my talk is about building a network, I'm going to pause here and mention that many of the people that I've encountered and relationships that I've built during this time would come back to, to me later in life in surprising and unexpected ways. So lesson one, you are part of a network before you even realize it. So everything I've talked to you up till now is just finding my way, orienting my direction towards a career in research science. I didn't know when I was observer that the relationships and the connections that I made would come back around later in my life. It would show itself that they, that, that was part of my network at that time. I didn't realize it. So each connection and relationship that you, that you make is building on your network. These can be professional or personal. It can be through your undergraduate school or your graduate school, jo through jobs, internships, volunteer work, through social groups, all of this is building your network. So I have to tell a funny and personal story of an example of how I didn't realize my network would come back to me. So when I was working out in New Bedford on commercial fishing boats, 
a good friend that I met as an observer was working with me as an observer. Many years later, after I had started graduate school and been living here in Newport, she shows up here to work on, on the NOAA groundfish trawl survey. Many of you know, Keith Bosley, who's my husband, he's been around and a fixture in HMSC community for a decade before my friend showed up, before I even arrived. And I had been here for two years before she arrived, but it was through her and her arriving here and my, not, my knowing her from my time working on the East Coast as an observer that brought us together. And that's how I met my husband here at Hatfield through my network. Okay, Hatfield. So a year in the high seas, time to go to grad school. Get accepted into the program here. It was not fish, fish it was the fish and wildlife program. The name has changed now. I arrived in fall of 2005. All I had was my surfboards, my bike, and I'd never been here before. Come driving into Newport, completely in awe. Um, but at this time uh, is when I really felt like I was starting to develop and build my network. Um, living on Newport, living in Newport and being on the Oregon coast was just filled with unimaginable beauty. And I fell right away into a cohort of peers. Uh, we together, we were nav navigating all sorts of challenges through graduate school, um, learning very tough academic material. And probably the hardest part of all was daily commuting to Corvallis for classes five days a week. So we formed a group and took turns driving and we made it work. So there you can see Hatfield, you guys, some of you are probably new to the area, but this will become a fixture in your mind forever, I promise. So on arriving, I entered the lab, Brett, Dr. Brett Dumbald, uh, and I sort of knew what his research topic was, but not really. Um, and coming off of working on the high seas, uh, it was kind of an abrupt transition to go back into intertidal work, studying burrowing shrimp, these little organisms that are shown here. I'm sure some of you will have the fun of doing working on these species as well this summer. Um, luckily, it was a comfortable transition for me because for all the years that I spent mucking around in the salt marsh in South Carolina, um, it was sort of a comfortable place to be. I loved invertebrates, invertebrates and most other experience I had up, up until the point kind of contributed to me really loving this and digging right in. And I stuck around for a while. I was here for 10 years, actually. I did my master's and my PhD working on burrowing shrimp um, and enjoying my fill of lots of field work using these highly technical pieces of equipment that are shown here. Um, strong back, a shovel, a cart, and a quadrat. It was pretty much all we needed. The work that we did, although it was based in Newport, and much of the work that we did is just right outside the back door here. It's very convenient to be so close to your research, by the way. Um, but the work that we did was all throughout Washington, Oregon estuaries. We covered a lot of ground. Some of the ground was very, very soft. In fact, so soft that you couldn't walk on it. And we needed to learn how to drive a hovercraft to get to areas that were not um, passable by foot. So we spent a while working on hovercrafts. We did a lot of boating and spending a lot of time walking across the moonscape like intertidal areas. This one here is showing me walking across the tide flat here in Yaquita Bay on Idaho Flats. But in Willapa Bay, you could be on the surface of the moon, feel like you're on the surface of the moon during low tide. Working with Brett on his projects was truly amazing. Um, it was a great experience, and I'm really proud of the contributions that I made to the products of that group. Here, we're just showing images of what it looked like on a quadrat when we were doing habitat classification surveys. And um, the products that came out of that were simply amazing. Just these massive classification and distribution maps of Willapa Bay, which is enormously huge. This is when my brain was really starting to make the connection between collecting data on the ground, in the field, with your feet on the mud, and the technical products that could be generated from those data. So I took some of these mapping elements and incorporated it into my PhD work. Um, and 
over time, being out in the field, what look, feeling and handling and uh, observing these populations, I became really fascinated with temporal changes and species density and distribution and did some of my own work um, looking at this here in Uquina Bay. Um, this is just a map of uh, burrowing shrimp density uh, across the four years that I uh, surveyed the population. And this was kind of a big project and I needed a lot of help with people from other people. So I enlisted the help of students, interns, other researchers, collaborators from other groups. And to this day, many of the um, set, uh, interns that were here at HMSC during the summers that we were collecting this data are still in my network. People that I interact with occasionally, I'll see at conferences or are working with uh, collaboratively now today, either directly or indirectly. So this takes me to lesson two, embrace your interests and hone your skills. Find out what you're good at and do it a lot. Become an expert. This lesson is about developing your skills and gaining confidence in your capabilities. And this can encompass any range of specialties. It can be coding, data analysis, communication, uh, it can be leadership. Um, having a strong skill set will make you a valuable team member and thus contribute to building your network and growing your network and opening doors to opportunity later on. So my example of this from this lesson is um, about the NOAA Fishery Sea Grant Fellowship Program I was lucky to be part of. So in the late stages of my PhD work, I really started to focus on my skills and interests. I loved coding. I had spent some time working on data. I liked making plots. People that I know that work with me know I love making plots. And I had a keen interest in population dynamics, observing those changes, those spatial and temporal changes over time, um, really got my mind very focused on that. So I applied for the NOAA Fisheries Sea Grant Fellowship Program. Uh, this is a program that lasted, that funded the last three years of my pro of my PhD, and supported my interest in learning more about the field of stock assessment. I pulled a few strings on my network to help, which I think helped make this a successful um, application. I had a key committee member that was a NOAA researcher at the time and who was familiar with NOAA research priorities. And I had a peer um, here that was in my graduate school cohort that had been awarded the fellowship just the year before. So I was able to use those resources and put together a really good application package. It was successful. And then I became part of this program, which was is very highly competitive. And the program is really designed to groom future stock assessment scientists and ecosystem modelers. Well, my work, as I described, was a little bit, little bit more field-based and empirical than the other fellows at the time. The goal was the same, to support students in a career, towards a career in quantitative ecology. Being awarded this fellowship really expanded my network a lot, uh, making connections with students from other universities, uh, experts in the field, and also learning, I learned a lot about the new and upcoming methods and technologies in quantitative fisheries. Also really allowed me to kind of dive into my um, interest and skills in developing those. And coming out of that program, I realized that I really like to code. That may seem, seem nerdy to me, but it's actually a really useful skill. And so for all of you, definitely try to learn how to code. It will open doors to opportunity, making graphs, like population dynamics, stock assessment, and modeling, interestingly. Also, what I learned is that I have a lot of interest in project management and leadership. Those are skills that I'd like to hone, that I have honed, and that I, like, I worked on while I was in this fellowship program. Lesson three, get out of your comfort zone. Dream big and take calculated risks. Calculated meaning that you always have something to fall back on. So some examples of this could be giving a talk, applying for a scholarship that might seem a little out of your league, lead a meeting or work group, connect. Don't be afraid to pick up the phone and connect with an expert in your field or take a tough job. Here I found this um, graphic to be quite interesting to me. Um, and it's based on you know, psychology of productivity. And you can see there that as performance increases, your level of anxiety also increases to an optimal level to which after you become seized with fear and you cannot be productive. 
this is sort of the feeling that you have to get out of your comfort zone, to get into your optimal level of productivity. You can't win if you don't try. So when I finished my PhD, I was here in Newport. I had a family. I kind of wanted to stick around. I was interested in stock assessment and modeling and coding, and I was looking for the next step. And so I applied for um, an NRC postdoc that, special, that was advertised for spatial stock assessment and modeling. And I received that, um, that postdoc. And uh, I, was, I joined, then I joined the assessment team in the Northwest Fisheries Science Center and became a mentee of six different project PIs, all that were very brilliant people and very accomplished in stock assessment. These folks shared a network and now I was part of it. And I had no idea what I was doing. Our project involved developing and testing new methods of incorporating spatial processes into stock assessments. Initially, I felt like I was way over my head, uh, but out of sheer hard work, determination, and leveraging the skill sets that I had been building and honing for many years prior, I really started to flourish in that position. It was amazing experience, and my mentors were very supportive the whole time. Through this experience, I became a proficient coder of highly complex multidimensional models and generalized automations. Together with my research team and my mentors, we developed simulation models and estimation models that, and put them to the test. We were looking at simulating multiple different um, spatial structures and putting them through new novel, different approaches of stock assessment. Um, through this novel work and the applications, that we put them through, the network that we shared really expanded. Over this three-year project, we ended up with five, five plus publications and a suite of methods that we developed together that are making their way into mainstream stock assessment tools. I started from feeling I was way out of my league and in the end, I was leading it. Okay, lesson number four, perfect your elevator speech. So I led my talk today with the elevator speech. This is all about communication. You need to be able to say who you are, what you do, some amount of your experience, why your work is important, and maybe you can add in your professional goals in a short and consistent and clear way. Can you provide that uh, a description of what you do and why it's important in one minute or less? This is about developing your confidence in how you present yourself. If it's done right, the short speech will help introduce yourself and make those connections in a compelling way and it can help and build your network. Each time that you talk to somebody at a mixer, at a poster session, in the hallway, at a conference, you're making and building those connections. So practice this. I have to be honest that I didn't practice my elevator speech. And I, in retrospect, I wish that I had really worked on that through every stage of my career. And it will evolve over time based on what you're doing at a given time. So that's my lesson to you. Work on your elevator speech, make those connections, be able to speak uh, about what you're doing clearly and, and get the point across in a short amount of time. This will help build your network. Okay, so I provided some lessons on how we can build our network um, and what, how that can open doors of opportunity um, and help you achieve your goals. There's some other ways that we can use our network and that's by leveraging them. This can be per personal or professional. Uh, the network is there, it can provide support, um, it can help you seek out opportunities um, and it can help you in creating new networks. Um, so now that I've shared my story um, in navigating the career path, um, my uh, lesson to you here is that don't be afraid to call on those connections to give you a leg up when you need it. So a fun personal example that I can share here relates to how being a part of the Hatfield community when I was a graduate student uh, really helped me a lot. Um, so me and several other moms, we were working towards trying to maintain our career and professional goals while also trying to raise families. 
in 2010, there were several, several of us that were having kids around the same time. And we had spouses that were all working. My husband was going out to sea a lot. And I did not want to give up my graduate education because I didn't have the, the time or the money to pay for a babysitter. So we all worked here together and all of us bound together to form what we call the babysitting co-op. We developed elaborate schedules and shared childcare duties so we could keep working on our career and professional goals. None of us had family, close family, grandmas and grandpas weren't, weren't around. So by us working together and pulling our networks together to support each other, we were able to do um, what we would have been really hard for us all to do and continue to achieve our goals. To this day, all these kids here are still best friends. And we're also very in touch with the families that were working together at that time. Okay, so that's my personal example of how the network can help you get a leg up and provide support when in times of need. But now I'm gonna talk more about a sort of scientific and professional example. So this, going back to Puget Sound, so where I started my talk, the job that I do right now, Puget Sound Crustacean Fishery Manager. This is the area that I'm gonna be talking about. Here's Port Townsend, just for illustration. That's where I work out of. But my jurisdiction is throughout this whole inland sea. And throughout the whole inland sea is a very vibrant fishery for Dungeness crab. It's a well-known, iconic, and highly regarded species. Uh, for those of us that live and work and play in the Pacific Northwest, we recognize the species that, to have an important role, um, both in the ecosystem and for the human communities um, where, they, where there's a high economic value and impact on the um, history of the area. So I don't do this alone, I said. I work with um, the treaty tribal co-managers to manage the um, Dungeness crab fishery. And there's 14 different uh, tribes that um, have treaty rights and access to the resource. And we all do it together. Um, and each year we have to come together, um, evaluate the resource, uh, develop management plans and assign quotas and then we manage our fisheries to stay within those quotas. Our fishery management scheme is extremely complex and we have multiple management regions that are based on political or geographic boundaries, not at all the biology of the organism. And for each one of these individual management areas, we have separate quotas. We manage them all separately and the tribes that we work with in each of those areas are different. This creates a very dynamic and complex fishery management environment. But the biology of the species is not predictable. So here is an example of the change in population for the Hood Canal, which is just a sub-basin in Puget Sound. And we did conduct annual surveys of um, uh, the population there with our, our crab pot surveys. And we see over time this really strong cyclical pattern in harvest and in catch per unit effort in our surveys. And so if we're signing quotas and you have an unpredictable resource, that makes it very difficult for co-management. And so I work with 14 other tribes and each tribe has a manager like me. And we all have the same questions. And we're wondering things like, is our current management approach working? Can we predict changes in the biomass for improved harvest of uh, harvest management? The reality is when we try to answer these questions that we have very limited data and very limited understanding of the resource. So we have to make decisions based on fairy dust and feelings. But the group of people that are working on that now are saying, this is not, this is not working for us. We need to do something new. We need to create something different. We need to generate this information that's lacking. So in the response to these concerns about these data gaps, all these different entities bound together and formed um, the Pacific Northwest Crab Research Group. And this started in 2018. 
So this slide only shows a fraction of the different partners that are involved in this group and this network. This is actually formed, which is called a learning network. Um, and so it involves academics, it involves state and federal agencies, uh, tribes, um, nonprofits, and industry members, all of us working together to help generate information through this learning network. And we've slowly been forming and creating a more structured kind of organization. We have a mission statement, um, and our mission is to promote and support sustainable Dungeness crab populations in the Pacific Northwest. So this is really what orients the direction of the learning network. And together, uh, we meet and discuss what are the current knowledge gaps are, and then define what the management priorities are. And then that drives where our, uh, we go with the research, what our research priorities are. And we've generated that into a research guide that's available on our website. And you can see this whole process. It's a, it's a whole process where we come together, we talk about the issues, the data that is missing, ways that we can fill those data gaps. And this is what we use to uh, pick off sort of what our project, our next projects are gonna be. So the groups formed in 2018, and we decided uh, that our first um, project would be to try to better understand larval flux and recruitment dynamics um, of Dungeness crab in Puget Sound. And because we have, we are all, we have our own networks that we're bringing together to create this learning network and shared knowledge. Uh, we pulled off of some technology and methods that have been used for a long, long time. And that is using uh, larval light traps. So this is based on the Allen Shanks model that has been um, applied in Coos Bay and in the coast for two decades now. And so we took these methods and this technology and we applied it to try to start tracking um, Dungeness crab larval flux at various points in the Puget Sound. It started initially with about five people putting these light traps in at different points that seemed biologically important. And now we're at this many light traps. The network continues to grow. And now it's not just fishery biologists, it's volunteers, students, it's tribal biologists, it's researchers. We've also gotten involved now with the Hakai Institute and they have built on and expanded the network up into the Salish Sea and further north. So this is how many light traps are in the water right now collecting Dungeness crab larvae all throughout the Salish Sea. And the data that we're getting from it is like we, nothing we've had before for this area. I know this is very complex, but this is basically showing um, the abundance of crab larvae that are caught in the traps across the four years prior to this year, 2019 through 2020, and all the different months. The surveys run from April until September. And each one of these blips and blops on here represents a separate individual light trap that's run by a different entity. Some are, like I said, they're students. They're, they're, based, they're being used as curriculum for high school students. Um, so all of us have different goals for what we want to use the data for, how we're using the instruments, but in the end, we're all creating the same data. We're all creating and contributing to this network that's generating information to help people like me that needs to manage the Dungeons Crab Fishery Resource in Puget Sound. So it started with a handful of groups and individuals that recognize that there's a need for information has now grown into this big thing that now supports students and fellow re research. It promotes education and curriculum development. It has provided many new employment opportunities throughout all the different groups that are involved in this network. We've had multiple successful grant proposals and we have improved co-manager relationships through this group. It has also um, continued collaborations and relationships among many people that have been connected over their careers. And this is just a picture of us in our winter meeting last January. And these are all the people that are here in that room with me on that day that I've been connected with at various points in my journey, in my path here. 
to this point now. So I'm still working with these people. They're all still part of my network. So it's a small world. We say it all the time, but it's true. And as you advance in your career, you'll, you'll recognize it more and more. So make it work for you. And just to recap on my pro tips, you are part of a network before you even realize it. Each one of those connections are meaningful and they can come around at a time that is surprising and unexpected. Embrace your interests and hone your skills. Find out what you're good at. Do it a lot. Practice, practice, practice. Put yourself out there. Get out of your comfort zone. Push yourself. Try something new. And perfect your elevator speech. And thanks for listening. Mm -hmm. Questions? Any questions? Any questions in the room? Hello, thank you for that. Um, in regards to getting out of your comfort zone um, and finding finding what you're good at and how you do it, how did how did experiences that you maybe weren't good at and didn't like doing help uh, forge your path as you move forward? That is a good question. So should I repeat the question? Okay, so everybody can hear. Um, not like in the old days where we had to repeat the question. Thank you, technology. Um, so the question is about whether uh, how the things that you weren't good at, um, you didn't like help forge your career path. I think the answer is in the question. Like once you, when you're exposed or asked to do something that you realize you're not good at or you don't like to do, it just helps in kind of, you know, redirecting you just iteratively as you go along. Yeah. And then with each movement, you're kind of finding new things that you are good at and it keeps you moving forward. That's how we can Questions. Thanks for coming to speak with us today. Um, my question is about how you best maintained those relationships with people who you weren't directly in front of. Um, like how did you maintain and keep in touch with those people? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm so I'm not so great with the personal relationship, but the professional relationships. Yeah. So it's really about um, building, you know, taking your network and creating new networks, um, developing collaborations and kind of keeping people and projects under your wing um, at arms, you know, not too far beyond arms distance away. Um, you know, when you are at conferences or you have the opportunity to connect with people that you've worked with in the past, make sure that you make the effort to do that. Um, cause then they'll always be in your mind and then you'll get their elevator speech and know what they're working on at a given time. And it, you can file that away and know that who to contact when the next project comes up, who to pull from your network to, you know, advance whatever the next thing is. So. Hi there, uh, my name's Hunter. Uh, I really appreciate you coming and speaking here today. Sure. Uh, I had a question about your work. Um, my partner is a commercial fisherman who's currently crabbing right now in Oregon. And I just wondered how you're uh, building relationships with commercial fishermen in Oregon. Oh, uh, so in, well, so I don't work in Oregon now, um, but we do a lot with the commercial fishermen. And through our, actually through the network, through the Pacific uh, Northwest Crab Research Group, we've recently started um, the CASE program, the Crabber and Science Exchange. It's actually built off of the program that they have here. And I think that's the SAFE program. Um, anyway, so we're engaging, we're having uh, community events with fishermen, uh, Washington, state of Washington and treaty tribal commercial fishermen to talk about issues that are important to them, um, things that we're working on, 
uh, in the management realm, uh, the data that we're collecting and the data that we need to be collecting, we're actually engaging now in a project to uh, contract uh, commercial fishermen to help us in completing surveys all throughout the Puget Sound. And so we are not gonna, each of the individual groups are not gonna be doing it. We're gonna be providing insight and staff on vessels, but the commercial fishermen are gonna be doing the work. And so we're just maintaining, we're trying to build um, really tight relationships to forge, um, you know, trust with the fleet and um, yeah, just collaboration. Questions? Online? I'm gonna be around through the afternoon and evening too. So happy to talk. There. Is this working now? Oh, great. Thanks for the talk. Um, this is really lovely. I was curious um, if you have experiences of feeling like maybe you didn't belong or not belonging in the specific research community you were in at any given time. And if so, would you be willing to speak to sort of how you overcame those feelings of not belonging? Yeah. Well, I guess I would go back to sort of my experience in sort of moving towards stock assessment, just because that was so different than what I had done for my PhD research and everything that was very, you know, field-based and empirical. And next thing you know, I'm in this like world of theoretical modelers that have never touched a fish before or been in the field or been on a boat. Um, and so I felt a little bit on the outside there. Um, but when it came down to what my job was there, it was to, you know, do the analysis, to work on the data, to, you know, run the models. And I really just kind of burrowed into that aspect. And through that is how I sort of developed my belonging there. Yeah. Caitlin, thank you. Sure. Really interesting. I like the case following on safe. That's great. Mm -hmm. So how did you and your group get through COVID? Do you have <laughs> some stories about that? Um, well, it was really hard. Um, I don't know if folks were aware, but when everything shut down, there were people on the with guns on the Capitol House in Washington, in Washington. And the first thing they wanted, because we'd shut down fishing. And uh, the reason why is because all of our fisheries in Washington have to be highly monitored because of our co our co management sharing obligations with the treaty tribes. So you can't just open fisheries, you need to be able to count your fisheries and you need staff and people to monitor. And so um, the governor said, Okay, we're opening fishing. And so my fishery was the first one to go. Um, that was the shrimp fishery in 2020. And it was really hard. Yeah, it was really hard. So we were the first ones out there. We had to take a lot of, um, you know, protective precautions, like no carpooling. And, you know, we, there were certain data that we couldn't collect because we can't get that close to people. When most other groups were not doing any work, we were out in the field and getting it done. And we didn't have a choice. And so we just powered through. We were being very innovative and a lot of the um, procedures that we developed for our team got ended up getting adopted by the agency. So other teams could get out in the field. Any other questions online, in person? I have a question. Um, great presentation. Uh, lovely to have you back again. Uh, as you can see, we've got quite a full house in here in the auditorium. Oh, yes, there you go. And um, you want to care to highlight what that is before I ask my question? Sure. Sure. Um, so in when I arrived here, I got plugged right into the Hatfield Student Organization. And uh, we did various different activities, uh, one of which was with Matthias, who's in the room, we started donuts. It's all a fixture for y'all, but we started it. And we also participated in the blessing of the fleet ceremony. And we had an HSO team that did the survival suit race. And so that is me. 
and Marisa, who was in our, our cohort, and Matias on the Coast Guard boat after they pulled us out of the water, after jumping off the dock down on the bayfront and doing the survival suit race. I did not get my um, suit zipped up all the way, so I swam at full speed with my suit wide open. And when they picked me up, they just lifted me right out of the suit. That's why my suit's not on, as you can see. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think uh, if anything, this highlights um, <laughs> that half the group in here are students, at least uh, undergrad interns, as well as graduate students. Um, and I think what you're what you highlight is the fact that this place is driven by student research activity, student energy, and we love having that. Um, can you talk a little bit about your um, the this the co student cohort experience here at the Marine Science Center. Yeah. Um, so we, I feel, yeah, the Science Center specifically. So we we had a cohort of graduate students that started around the same time, um, and we were all taking. We all were faced with the same challenges. Of at this time, we did not have remote classes. You know, polycom was not a thing, and so we're like driving to and from Corvallis all the time and to go to classes. And my research was here with my lab and that was fabulous, but school was in Corvallis, <laughs> which made it really challenging. Um, and so we really bound together, um, you know, from that very first year and kind of carried that through. And a lot of us, you know, it took us two years to do two to three years to do our masters. Many of us stayed on to do a PhD. And so this was like a group of people that I was working with, interacting with socially and professionally. And Marisa works with WDFW now, like we still work together. People that I worked with, uh, that I was in graduate school with, I work with now daily. Um, and so it's just relationships that you build, you develop very tightly, and then they just carry, carry along with you the whole time till now forever. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. There are no more questions. Um, please join me in thanking Dr. Caitlin Bosley for joining us today. So before we break, uh, we do have a couple of um, uh, additional things that are happening today uh, with the symposium. I got my notes here. Uh, so we do have ballot voting. Um, so the rest of the afternoon, we have a poster session and ignite talks or lightning talks. Uh, so for before we break for the poster session and refreshments in the atrium. We'd like to remind folks of the ballot voting for best poster and best Ignite talk. So every year, uh, an additional popular vote award is given to the student with the best poster of a 2023 awardee, uh, $100, and the best Ignite talk or lightning talk, $200. Uh, ballots will be available for the community members to vote. They'll be at the uh, base of the stairs outside here. Uh, with inf more information and details on the voting. Uh, we will start the poster session promptly here. Uh, we'll go until 345. Also, please check out the Youth as Inventors poster session in the iLab, the Innovation Lab, right behind these stairs around the back. And we have refreshments in the lobby also around the back. All right, and then we'll resume back in here with the lightning talks at 350. Thank you. Here, and then